Hello, uh, welcome to this uh, session. Uh, today we're going to begin uh, a new chapter, which is uh, the network layer for wireless sensor network or uh, routing layer protocols for wireless sensor uh, networks. In the previous slides, or in the previous uh, videos, we uh, discussed point-to-point -point communication. Uh, this was the responsibility of the different uh, physical layer uh, protocols. Then we considered uh, the case where uh, in a single hop uh, environment, multiple nodes share the medium, the arbitration of the medium, uh, is the responsibility of the protocols at the uh, medium access control uh, layer. Uh, today we're going to uh, consider the case where we need uh, multi-hop uh, communication and uh, routing uh, protocols. It is uh, possible that uh, two nodes uh, which are uh, far away from uh, one another may wish to exchange uh, packets, in which case we have to insert an additional intermediate node uh, to serve as a relay node so that it can receive packets from one of these nodes and forward on behalf of this node to the other uh, node. Uh, two nodes may not uh, communicate uh, directly with one another uh, for different uh, purposes. The, the, the first uh, reason, as I just mentioned, is if the transmission range of uh, one of the nodes or uh, both nodes uh, is shorter than the distance that separates them, in this case, uh, due to physical uh, limitations, uh, the, the physical limitations, they should be able to include an intermediate node uh, for the communication. But uh, th this is the case where we have uh, this intermediate node which uh, forwards uh, packets uh, on behalf of these two communicating nodes. We may still uh, prefer to use an intermediate node for packet uh, forwarding, especially if we wish to establish a network, even when the source node and the destination node may communicate uh, directly, even if it were physically uh, possible for two nodes to communicate directly, it may still be advisable for the inclusion of an intermediate node. And uh, one of the reasons is to conserve uh, energy or to improve the energy uh, cost of uh, communication. This is uh, an example. The best channel, the best uh, communication scenario we can achieve between two directly communicating nodes is a line of sight communication. Uh, the line of sight communication here, the, the, as you can see, enables nodes to directly communicate with one another, but the, the power of the packet that can be received by the uh, receiver is a function of the transmission power and the distance separating the two nodes. It is directly proportional to the uh, transmission power and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. So even when we have a line of sight communication be between two nodes, as the distance between them increases, the rate at which the power falls or drops increases quadratically. So long range communication is quite costly because in order to reach the unappreciable signal to noise ratio, 
with the increment in distance, then the transmission power should be increased twice. But when the nodes may not be able co to communicate directly at the case in the second uh, figure, as you can see, there is now a barrier to the line of sight communication. And the signal should reach uh, its destination via reflection. Then the transmission power now falls, not at the square of the distance, but at a power which is appreciably larger than two. So here you can see, for example, if there is only a single reflection, uh, we have a power of four. So that means as the distance between two communicating nodes increases, even if theoretically it were possible for them to directly communicate, it does not mean energy efficient, which is why we need to include another intermediate node uh, to minimize the cost of transmission. Another side effect of long range communication is that now the interference range of the communicating nodes also increases. This is especially the case when the transmission power is appreciably high. That means the two communicating nodes more likely now disturb or interfere with other neighboring nodes. For all these reasons, I have just mentioned now three different types of uh, causes or reasons, short range multi-hop communication may be advisable as you can see here. Another uh, aspect of short range multi-hop communication is that now we can also cover a large uh, sensing uh, range if nodes were to communicate with one another via multiple uh, communication. If we just have a single path from the source to the destination, here we are not talking about routing or we don't even need a routing uh, protocol. Routing protocols come into question when we are dealing with multiple possible routes from a source to a destination, in which case we have to take into account many factors to identify the most suitable route. So here, for example, we have different, uh, three different types of uh, routes if the source here wishes to communicate with the sink or with the uh, destination. One of the routes is this one, the other this one, and the other the one on the bottom. In this case, we talk about routing and we need a routing protocol to determine for us the most suitable uh, routing. Routing and routing, the design of routing protocols is a wide research field in many wireless and wired uh, networks because um, one of the uh, reasons is to minimize end-to-end -end, uh, packet transmission latency, especially if we are dealing with streaming uh, uh, applications, uh, real-time applications, we have to take into account uh, the end-to-end -end, uh, latency. Another aspect, this is particularly the case for wireless sensor networks, is the cost of communication. The more sensor nodes we involve, the more appreciable becomes the, the, the energy uh, cost because now the cost of individual nodes belongs also to the overall cost of the, the application. So in order to minimize energy cost, in order to minimize um, end to end latency, and also security to ensure that the uh, data uh, originating from the source and reaching the destination 
is not compromised in between uh, a routing protocol has to carefully select uh, and maintain the most suitable routes. Uh, here I have now uh, uh, designated three different uh, possible routes. Now the question is which of these routes is essential or the best if the source and the destination node wish to uh, the, wish to communicate with one another. Uh, we have to take different types of routing uh, metrics for the routing protocol to make a uh, decision. Uh, these metrics are objectively uh, defined, but it is up to the application which has to identify which of these metrics is important for it. For example, we can't define a minimum hop. Minimum hop, the application wishes not to involve many relay, uh, relay nodes or the routing protocol may not wish to uh, ident uh, involve many intermediate nodes. In this case here, you can see the one in the middle is only two hop. It involves a single uh, intermediate node. The green one here is three hop uh, uh, from the uh, destination. And the one on the bottom, is for hop. If the routing metric dictates that minimum hop should be uh, selected, then the one in the middle is the best route. But minimum hop is not always desirable. For example, the uh, intermediate node may be busy for whatever reason, because of uh, its own sensing assignment or because other uh, nodes, neighbor nodes, wish also to communicate uh, with it, in which case now there will be a congestion along this path. That means avoiding the uh, intermediate uh, or the, the, the middle route may be advisable. So minimum hope does not necessarily mean uh, minimum end-to-end -end, uh, latency or for that matter, minimum energy consumption. Another criteria we need to take into account is the overall cost of packet transmission. That means minimum amount of packet transmission energy. For example, here the, 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 the figures you see are the energy cost in unit, in some unit for a single a packet. So if the, the source wishes to communicate with this intermediate node, that it requires three units of energy. If this node wishes to communicate with this one, it requires now four units of energy and so on. So if we have to take into account the overall energy cost, then the, the first route, the one on top, has five units of energy for a single packet. The one in the middle uh, will incur about seven seven units of uh, energy and the one on the bottom as you can see costs uh, six units of energy in which case now the one on top is the best route another important metric this is particularly the case for wireless sensor network uh, networks is the maximum uh, uh, minimum available power. I'm going to explain this uh, shortly, but before that, in general, we have to take into account the problem of fragmentation. If some nodes are used as intermediate nodes quite often, they may exhaust their energy quickly, and then the roots will be broken. If this route is bro broken and if the nodes are critical to uh, the connectivity of the network, then with their uh, being no longer available, then there might be a partitioning in the network. This has to be avoided at any cost. 
That means routine protocols should also take into account not only the energy cost, but also the available energy of individual nodes to make sure that nodes do not exhaust energy uh, prematurely. This is, for example, the case here. Here, the, 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 the figures in red depict the available power nodes half. The smaller this uh, available power, the more likely it will be for the node to die. And if the node is dead, now an entire route might be uh, broken and no longer available for communication. So the force uh, matrix we have to take into account is the minimum amount of available power. So the maximum minimum available uh, power metric functions like this. We consider this route and see what is the minimum power available in this, in this route. Which node had the minimum power available? In this case, we have here eight. Again, we look into this route and see what the minimum available power. We see here seven. Again, we look the, here and the minimum available power is 10. So which of these routes is more likely to last longer? In this case, of course, the one on, uh, on the bottom because it had all its nodes, all its participating nodes have sufficient available power. So in this case, the maximum minimum available power take, compares the three minimum powers. Here we have a minimum power of eight, here we have a minimum power of seven, and here we have a minimum power of 10, and the maximum of this is 10, and that is in root three. So the routing protocols, the routing protocol identifies the third route as the most likely or the most suitable routes for the source and destination to exchange packet. With this brief description about uh, the, necessary, the, the, the importance of defining routing metrics, here I give you a broad overview of how we can classify routing uh, protocols for wireless sensor networks, not only for wireless sensor networks, this also um, applies for wire, uh, wireless networks in general and uh, ad hoc networks in particular. So we can classify routes based on the topology of the network. We have a flat topology, we have hierarchical topology, we have topologies which are hybrid, I'm going to explain to you uh, briefly. We also take into account how routes are discovered regardless of the topology. So we have a reactive mechanism, we have proactive mechanism and a hybrid uh, approach. And we can also classify or categorize routing protocols based on their operation, based on how they forward uh, packets. Some uh, routing protocols are negotiation based. That means before packets, actual data packets are transmitted and negotiation takes place, I'll show you why. Uh, there are routing protocols which support multiple uh, paths, so they, this is especially important when we uh, want to um, ensure that the transmission of packet is uh, highly reliable. We don't wish to lose uh, packets on the way. Uh, there are also query-based protocols. I mean, routing protocols begin to uh, operate only when the um, sync or the destination uh, generates. Uh, query uh, or the application also may define some quality of service uh, for to assist the routing protocol uh, define uh, routes or based on some probabilistic uh, aspect here we have uh, coherence uh, based uh, routing uh, protocols so you can see the wide 
aspect, a wide range of aspects we need to take into account when we qualify a routing protocol for a particular uh, application. These uh, aspects we're now going to see in more uh, detail. In general, the topology of a network describes how the nodes are interconnected with one another, the, how physically the nodes are interconnected with one another, and at the logic level, which nodes should interact with which node. So it is both a physical aspect, uh, taking into account the placement and connectivity of the nodes, and the logical aspect dictating which nodes should communicate with which nodes. In a flat topology networks, all nodes can communicate with one another. There is absolutely no restriction. Communication essentially takes place based on local information only. And all nodes play similar roles. Namely, all of them sense, all of them do local processing, and participate in neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor packet forwarding. These type of protocols are highly robust when nodes come and go, but they are also very costly. We're going to see some uh, routing protocols based uh, on uh, flat uh, topology. In a hierarchical topology, on the other hand, different roles are assigned to different nodes. That means some nodes are considered to be child nodes and other nodes are considered to be cluster heads. And child nodes can only forward packets to their cluster heads and not to any other node. And cluster heads can directly forward the packet to the base station or to a gateway in some cases when a cluster head may not be able to directly communicate with a gateway, then it has to forward packets to another um, cluster head. So the hierarchy of communication is well defined to make communication efficient. The problem with hierarchical uh, topology is the cost of establishing this hierarchy. We're going to see how much it costs and the associated uh, complexity. So we're going to begin our, uh, this is uh, a typical example of uh, a hierarchy, a hierarchical uh, topology. Here the, the black uh, nodes are cluster heads, the white nodes other than the sink are uh, child nodes. So each child node forwards packet to its cluster head and the cluster heads communicate directly to the sink. The sink is the destination of the uh, data in wireless sensor network. This sink may also be the gateway to the internet, so the packet can be forwarded to, uh, to the internet or to the cloud to save uh, the data. <coughs> uh, so we're now going to begin with uh, flat topology uh, networks. As I mentioned, the principal communication paradigm for flat topology networks is flooding. That means flooding uh, nodes receive packets, broadcast packets from their neighbor. They evaluate these packets to determine whether it is for them or not. If it's not for them, then they forward it to their uh, neighbors. By so doing, the packet progresses towards its destination. Nodes, participating nodes, do not need to establish any routing table. They don't need to remember anything. So the way storage is a critical resource, when memory is a critical resource, this is the best way to communicate. Another advantage of flooding is the dynamic, if the, 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 the dynamics of the network is fastly changing. That means it doesn't make sense to keep
keep history of one's neighbor. Because here, flooding just simply happens by receiving and rebroadcasting packets. You don't need to remember uh, notes, do not need to remember anything. But flooding comes at a cost because other words such as this, the whole network will be flooded by, by packets. The transmission cost is very high. Nodes may receive redundant information and the whole paradigm does not take into account the resource, the available resource of nodes. By, uh, because the, it may require lots of energy receiving and uh, rebroadcasting. Uh, nodes may receive redundant information uh, determining whether uh, packets are redundant or not requires some computing. Uh, this also requires some computing resources and uh, energy. So flooding is robust, but it has its own shortcomings. Some nodes, uh, some routing protocols, which are based on flooding, try to uh, minimize the cost of flooding by distinguishing packets in terms of uh, data packets, actually which are very large in size, and routing packets, which are slim packets uh, required or used only for determining routes. So two types of packets are defined here. The first one are actual data packets, which can be large in size. And there are packets which are used only for searching for routing. By so doing, the, 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 root, the routing packets will be flooded because of their size, the, the cost of flooding will be not appreciable. Once routes are defined, however, unicast communication, direct communication is used to transfer data packets. So this is in general how flat topology networks or how flat topology routing protocols deal with the cost of flooding. The first protocol we're going to see is SPIN. SPIN distinguishes between three different types of packets to minimize the cost of uh, flooding. It's a proactive based uh, protocol. That means when nodes detect something interesting, they in begin transmitting packets proactively. They don't wait a query to arrive. So they sense something, they detect something, and then they communicate with their neighbors to push the packets to a destination node. In doing so, now they, they, they distinguish three different types of uh, packet, which I'm going to explain to you with this diagram below. So here A is a source node. It has detected something interesting but it does not flood the network with data packet because flooding, as I told you, is costly. Instead, it will send a very slim packet called advertisement. In the advertisement, there is only a metadata about the data packets. For example, temperature has exceeded 24 degrees centigrade, or I have detected a concentration of H2O, uh, sorry, H2S, above 10 or 15 ppm and so on. If nodes are interested in this packet, they will reply a request. So now we have two types of overhead packets, the request as well as the advertisement. When the node receives the advertisement, then actual data communication takes place. The two communication here are unicast. 
unicast means the packet contains a destination and source address. Nodes intercepting this packet, they don't process it, they don't participate in the communication. So this is a three-way handshake to minimize the cost of flooding. But here again, there is no hierarchy, nodes are free. So if nodes come and go, the communication is not disturbed. But remember, whether it's in flat topology or in hierarchical topology, there has to be end-to-end -end connectivity for the sensor network to function properly. Uh, some of the merits of a spin is uh, simple, it is quite elastic, but it functions well for a single hop communication. If, if all nodes reach each other uh, within a single hop distance, that doesn't mean that the, the network does not uh, function for multi-hop communication. It does because if, for example, here, if C receives advertisement and it does need the, the, the packet or it's not interested in the packet, it can rebroadcast bro this to its neighbor and its neighbor can rebroadcast until the advertisement arrives at the at the destination but spin the the reconstruction of a route from the so uh, from the sink back to the source is not straightforward but i'm going to show you how this can be made uh, possible spin does not enable multi hop communication or efficient multi hop communication. If it's a single hop uh, within a single hop communication, then by avoiding the flooding of data packets, it tries to minimize the cost of packet transmission. Another important uh, routing protocol, which was first uh, proposed at the UCLA, University of California uh, LA campus, is directed diffusion. Directed diffusion is a reactive based uh, protocol. It's not a proactive based uh, protocol. That means source nodes wait until they have received a query. A query describes interest. So here, for example, a sink that the base station describes its interest. For example, I'm interested in, the temp in a temperature above 25 degrees centigrade or in H2S concentration above 10 ppm. This interest will be propagated using flooding. The assumption here is that the, the size of the packets describing interest is slim. Nodes again simply rebroadcast until this interest reaches a source, a source which has actually detected a temperature above 25 degrees centigrade or a concentration of H2O above 10 uh, ppm. So here the sink publishes interest and this interest will be rebroadcast. Suppose the source has now intercepted this packet and it wishes to send uh, this packet. Now what it does is the thing also reproducts its availability. It says I am the source, I have this uh, packet. But now the nodes before they forward or reproduce the packet, they modify the content of this packet by including the hop distance. So they say, I have received this packet. I am one hop away from the source. Then this node will receive this packet and say, I have received this packet. I am two hop away from the source. And then it rebroadcasts. By so doing, the data arrives at the sink. Now the sink may receive the same packet from different intermediate nodes. 
which may also have different hope numbers or which are different hop distance away from the source. In which case now the sink selects the best route which satisfies its routing requirement. This could be minimum hop distance, this could be the, the different routing uh, metrics we considered uh, previously. So in just hop distance is one of the, the possibilities. They also can put their energy reserve into this uh, packet so that the source knows which node has minimum energy available, which source has used uh, maximum uh, power in rebroadcasting uh, packets. Based on all this available information, now the sink can determine which route it has to take. And it reinforces only that route. And then from now onwards, communication takes place using a unicast dedicated channel. So here, uh, uh, directed diffusion, as you can see, has a more complex structure. Routes are modified on the way, sorry, packets are modified on the way for nodes to enter some parameters into the, the packet to enable the sync select the best route. And finally, the source, sorry, the sync reinforces only that route which best satisfies its requirement. And then from then onwards, now data communication takes place between the source and the sink. So here we have now distinguished the transmission of data packets from all other packets. And by doing this type of classification, the cost of flooding can be minimized. So as a summary, directed diffusion takes place in three stages. First is the propagation of interest. Second is the creation of gradient. Gradient creation simply means nodes input into this uh, search packet some routing uh, metrics so that the sync can determine which of these routes best satisfy the requirements of the application. And finally, the route that best satisfies the requirement of the application will be chosen, reinforced, and packet transmission takes place only through this uh, route. Compared to spin, this is more complex, supports uh, different types of the definition of different types of routing uh, metrics. It works well for multi hop uh, communication. The, the problem with uh, directed diffusion is, of course, it is not proactive. That means from the time interest is published to the, uh, the receiving of the actual packets, some time elapses and this adds up to the end-to-end -end, uh, latency of the network. There are proactive uh, routing uh, protocol based on the knowledge of distance, Num taking the hop distance uh, into account. This type of protocols are called distance vector routing. Most of this work based on the keeping of a routing table locally. That means nodes know how many hop distance away they are from a sink or a source, and they take this knowledge into account to forward a uh, packet or to participate in a routing uh, protocol. Again here, look, vector dis uh, distance vector routing protocols keep table. That means they need some memory for managing this routing table. 
but they don't flood the network as, uh, uh, to minimize energy uh, consumption because since they have tables, they can use unicast communication to send packet uh, to their uh, communicating partners. So this is, for example, how it works. Here we have a topology, as you can see, and let's just consider the table D manages to communicate with it, its neighbors. For example, if D wishes to communicate with A, it just needs to know that its next uh, destination is B. The next hop is B, and A is two hop away from it, as you can see here. B is a direct communication. C can be reached via B. Again, it's only two hop away from, from D, and so on. So here we, D keeps only this table, and if it wishes to communicate with A, it just needs to know the, the next hop. It's up to B to know that A is its neighbor, and then it can forward packet to it. If nodes in the meantime move or exhaust their energy, then the node which is directly a direct neighbor to them is responsible to update all its neighbors. Here, for example, C moves from this place to this place. So in which case it's up to B to notify both A and D. Then if D get notification from B, it just need to modify the routing table as far as it is concerned without needing to discard and redefine the routing table. This is the way how uh, distance vector based routing protocols function. They are proactive because they don't need to calculate routes to, to communicate because they have already the routing table. But so latency is uh, minimized, but managing routing table can be costly, especially if the network dynamic is relatively high. That means if nodes move from place to place or if they exhaust or for whatever reason not available, then it has to be updated. So keeping a routing table requires memory, updating the routing table requires communication and some, some computation. And especially if the network size is large, then the size of the routing table could also be appreciably large. There are some distance vector routing which try to avoid the use of a routing table. And I'm going to explain to you one of the popular uh, reactive uh, routing protocol in this regard. So it's called the ad hoc on demand distance uh, vector. It does not use a routing table. Routes are computed or identified only when a need arises. If there is no need, then no routes will be determined. It is an interesting uh, protocol and uh, widely used in the wireless sensor uh, community as well as in uh, wireless ad hoc uh, networks. The way it works is the following. It's very simple but intelligent. If a node wishes to send data to a destination, but if it does not know the address of the destination, it just generates a sequence number, a unique sequence number. And it sends its address, its own address or ID, and this sequence number, nothing else. All intermediate nodes keep intermediate, uh, sorry, this uh, sequence number. 
they participate in packet forwarding if the sequence number they receive from the neighbor is either equal or greater than the, the, the sequence number they keep locally. If the sequence number is greater than the sequence number they keep coming from the same neighbor, now they know that this request is a new request. So they rebroadcast. If, however, the sequence number is less than the sequence number they keep locally, they know that this is an old packet. They have already participated, so they won't rebroadcast this packet. By so doing, they minimize the amount of packets that can be flooded in the network. So let me repeat again. The ad hoc on demand distance vector routing takes place only using a sequence number. A node wishing to communicate with a source and does, which does not know the address or the, the route to the, the sync generates a sequence number. Let's say I generate a sequence number that says two and I send this sequence number with my ID. A neighbor receiving this uh, packet sees whether it has a packet, a sequence number, it stores a packet which it has received from me having a sequence number two. It doesn't, then it can do two, one of the two decisions. If it knows the route to the sync, it will immediately reply to me saying, okay, this is the, the way you can communicate. So I don't need to rebroadcast. I don't need to flood the network. So I can use the information I receive from my neighbor and then communicate with the sync. If my neighbor does not know and the sequence number is new, it rebroadcasts. All the other intermediate nodes will check whether this sequence number is new and whether they have a complete knowledge of the route to the sink. If they have root, uh, knowledge to the sink, they will reply to the node that sends it to them, and that one communicates with, with me. Otherwise, they will rebroadcast until the packet finally arrives at the destination. Then the destination responds only to the node from which it has received this sequence number first, or from the node which is minimum hop away from the source. And then this reply will re-propagate that back now node with a broadcast, but unicast. It is a, it's similar to gradient uh, formation. Only here, the way roots are strengthened or uh, reinforced is relatively simple, just based on the sequence number and the hop distance of nodes. So let's see how this uh, functions uh, figure out. So here we have a source. It wishes to communicate with this destination. So it generates a sequence number and then along with its own ID sends all to all its neighbors. The neighbor keep the sequence number for the first time and report cast the packet until the packet arrives at the destination. But whenever they repropagate, they have to also modify the packet by putting 
their hop distance. So this one says, okay, I'm hop distance one. This one says I'm hop distance two. This one says I'm hop distance three and so on. So by the time the packet arrives at the destination, it receives now multiple packets with the same sequence number, remember, but different now in terms of hop distance. Then it will choose a unicast communication with one of them which has which is the minimum hop away from the source and once this route is now established data communication takes place but for propagating request broadcast is used now suppose this node let's say this node now Suppose it receives the sequence number two. It receives sequence number two here. It will receive sequence number two from here. Let's just assume, or it receives sequence number two from here. If this sequence number, now it has received three packets with the same sequence number, but with different hop distance. So this node, Suppose this is now one, two, three, four. It's now four hop away from the destination. This one, one, two, three, four, also four for, for, for this case. Suppose this were five. Now this node, if the hop distance from here is five, it will not reproduce the, the, the packet received from this node because it has already received a sequence number of two and a hop distance of four. All other packets which have the same sequence number or a sequence number less than the one which it keeps or a hop distance which is greater than the one it has already received, it does not participate in the communication. By so doing, it minimizes the amount of packets that are flooded in the network. So ad hoc on-demand distance vector routing avoids the management of tables. It does not use tables, but it is now reactive. This is the cost. It tries to minimize the cost of establishing root by simply using sequence numbers. The sequence number tells how timely a packet is. So that if by some reason, some old request for packets are received, they won't be flooded. So just using a, a sequence number and knowledge of hop distance, it minimizes flooding and it facilitates the speed at which routes are constructed. Okay, the route reply now includes the route reply, which is a, 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 a unicast address includes the, 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 the destination address in the next node which has to be which has to participate in the communication. Okay, so far we have considered different types of flat topology routing protocols. The main aim, as I told you, is to minimize the cost of flooding because flooding is exclusively used to establish routes. And most of this try to minimize. So by distinguishing between routing packets and data packets. Data packets are usually big size packets whereas routing packets are used for discovering routes and they are slim in nature. For spin, they use just metadata. 
for direct diffusion, they use uh, they, they describe interest and describe some routing matrix such as available energy and hop distance. For ad hoc on demand routing, it contains sequence number, the source address, and the hop distance. By doing so, we separate the concern of establishing a route and the concern of using a route for data packet communication. Establishing a route has some latency uh, cost. In order to minimize this latency uh, cost, uh, vector, uh, distance vector routing protocols can be proactive by keeping a local routing table and by updating this table. Next, we are going to see hierarchical protocols. In a hierarchical uh, topology, the network has a well-defined structure. And the way nodes communicate with one another is also well-defined. That means we have cluster heads. Cluster heads manage a number of child nodes. They define, for example, TDMA for them so that they can communicate with the cluster head collision free. They can define our sleeping schedule for them because the cluster heads can forward packets to the child nodes. And if the child nodes are sleeping, they can store the data for them until they, they, they wake up. So there is a well-defined structure uh, taking a place. The, the main problem with uh, cluster formation is that it is quite costly. Uh, I'm going to uh, explain to you one uh, cluster uh, clustering protocol we have defined uh, at our uh, lab. The advantage of hierarchical communication is that it's efficient, it's collision free, and you can use the, the network for long uh, term sensing. And uh, it's also end to end latency is significantly smaller than flat topology uh, networks. But remember the, the, the side effect of a hierarchical structure is establishing the hierarchy. Establishing the hierarchy is a costly uh, process. Defining clusters, associating uh, nodes to these uh, clusters. Uh, cluster heads have now uh, pronounced activity. They may exhaust their energy more quickly than the child nodes. This may necessitate the exchange of roles uh, on a periodic uh, basis. All this is energy intensive. Okay. I'm going to explain to you now one uh, cl uh, uh, clustering algorithms, uh, which uh, myself and one of my postdoc uh, developed at the energy lab at the faculty of uh, computer science uh, at TU Dresden, TU Dresden. So here we have, suppose this is a network we deploy to sense toxic gas in an oil a refinery. So the first thing we need to make sure is that nodes can, uh, there is a connectivity from one end of the network to the other end of the network. This is a must. If nodes are not connected with one another, we have to intentionally add additional uh, nodes uh, to make sure that uh, this connectivity is maintained. Otherwise, the network will fragment and we are not talking about a network, but different uh, networks. Now the question is, if we wish to designate some of these nodes as cluster heads so that we can make the data collection assignment efficient, which of these nodes should be assigned as cluster heads? We, as 
alert that we can take advantage of the connectedness of the network to determine cluster heads. So the first thing is to mathematically represent this topology. We can use an adjacency, a binary adjacency matrix to describe the topology of the network like this. So here we can see, see that with, for example, here node one, the rows describe nodes and the column describe the nodes with which they can directly communicate. So here, for example, for node one, you can see node one is directly connected with node two and node four. So here, node one, as you can see here, is directly connected with node two and node four. With all the other nodes, it's not directly connected. Similarly, node two is directly connected with node one, with node three and node five. So here you see node five, two is directly connected with node one, node three and node five. Likewise, we can describe the connectivity of all the other nodes this way. If we add either the column or the, the rows, it gives us the node degree, the number of nodes with which a node directly communicates. So to simplify the analysis, I have now a simple network here. So here you can see that this type, let's assume for some physical, uh, uh, because of some physical condition, the nodes can communicate like this with one another. So node two can communicate with node three only, node three can communicate with all of them, node one communicates with node three and node six and so on. This we can describe using the adjacency matrix again. So here, for example, if you add the columns, node one has two degree, that means it can communicate with two nodes, node two has just one degree, node three has five degree, and so on. The interesting aspect of the adjacency matrix is that if you square the adjacency matrix, for example, if, if we square the adjacency matrix, we will find out the number of nodes with which a node establishes two hop communication. This is very fascinating. So here is the, the, the square of the metric. The diagonal element we just forget because a node cannot communicate with itself, just forget it. But all the others tells you squaring two, the number of nodes with, with which, or the number of two hop links nodes establish with one another. So for example here, if you take four and five, the square of the adjacency matrix is two. That means node four and five can communicate with each other using two hop links in two different ways. So here is one, node five and node four can communicate this way. This is one, because this, you see, one hop, two hop, or using six, one hop, two hop. So there are two, two hop links. If we now cube the adjacency matrix, it tells you the number of three hop links nodes establish with the neighbors. If you now take the power of four, it will tell you the number of four hop links each node establishes with its neighbor. So in general, for example, here, two and uh, three, if we see, if we just square the, the, the adjacency metric, there is no two hop link between them. You see here, two and three can communicate with each other only using a single hop link. So the result is zero here, you see. So the adjacency metric is a critical component for clustering the network for determining how well connected 
nodes are with one another. So what we do, the, the, the problem with uh, wireless communication is that this link is a probabilistic link. If node one wishes to send a packet with node three, packet may arrive only with a certain probability. You cannot make sure with 100% accuracy that the packet arrives. So we have a certain probability for a node to send a packet to its neighbor because of the inherent nature of the wireless medium. Now, given this P, suppose one wishes to communicate with six, with node six. How many, what is the probability that the packet arrives at six? If this link is very harsh, you know, packet reach using a single link or a single hop with a probability of P, but the packet may be lost with a probability of one minus P. Or the packet may be received by three and three may forward it to six. Or if this link is bad, three may forward it to four and four may forward it to six and so on. So here we have three different possibilities. A one hop here, you see a one hop, a direct communication. This is one probability or a two hop link here, you see, or a three hop link, but now we have two three hop links, but we have no other links. So the probability of successfully transmitting packets from one to six can be described as this. P plus P square, this is the square of the adjacency matrix. Two, this is the, 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 the cube of the adjacency matrix, but now the probability is P times P times P for three. P times P for two and P for one. So here we have now one link or one hop, one two hop and two three hop links and we can describe this as a geometric progression. Now in general, if we have an adjacency matrix and if we know the probability of successfully transmitting a packet, then we can do the following. In order to take advantage of the geometric propagation or the geometric uh, series, we can normalize the adjacency matrix. Suppose C is the adjacency matrix. We can normalize the adjacency matrix by the number of nodes in the network. So for a fully connected, a fully connected network, C over N minus one is always N, uh, always one. For fully connected network, that means, for example, let me show you here, six and three. If you see three, three is fully connected with all of them. Three is connected with one, two, three, uh, two, four, and so on. So three, the degree of three is n minus one. So if I normalize the degree of three, this will be one. So H is now a metric, an adjacency metric, just normalized adjacency matrix. If I power the normalized adjacency metric by K, this will tell me the number of k hops the nodes establish with their neighbors. And if I take advantage of this expression, this gives me the probability of the message coming from one reaches 
six. So the more connected the two are, the bigger the probability, the less connected the two are, the less the probability. So now here, I can determine the connectivity of the nodes by using this expression. So P the power of K tells me that the probability of each hop and H tells me the relative connectivity of the nodes. So this is a geometric series taking this uh, expression, I will get this is the relative connectivity of the nodes. If I now arrange the nodes according to their relevance, according to their connectivity, so six for, for, for the previous, uh, for the previous, uh, for this one here, if I calculate the relative connectivity of the nodes, what I will get is six is the least relevant node in the network and 18 is the most relevant node, the most connected node in the network. So I can take advantage of this knowledge to assign cluster heads. So for example, I can say the top five relevant nodes should be cluster heads because they are well connected in the network. If I do so, this is what I get. These are the cluster heads and all the others should associate with their nearest cluster heads. The problem with this approach is that the nodes, the cluster heads are not well distributed. So some of the cluster heads can take a good number, uh, uh, the nodes which are near, the, uh, near, near them with well distributed child nodes, but all the others may have a skewed relationship with the other nodes. So for example, if node one is associated with 18 node, data coming from node one will reach a node 18 using one, two, three, four, five, six hops. Whereas if I associate 32 with 33, it just reaches using a single hop. That means the end-to-end -end latency for different nodes is different because the cluster heads are not well distributed. But now I can introduce a constraint. I can say, for example, there should be at least a minimum of two hop distance between two cluster heads. So if I say that, the nodes, no node within a single hop, this is the number one most relevant node according to our calculation, 18. Now all nodes which are single hop away from it should be associated with it as its cluster, as its child nodes. So no node should be a cluster head within this distance. Even if it is relative significance, is high. Now, next in my relevant node is 33, then I will make now 33 the cluster head. The next one is 25, but now 25 is already associated, so it's not qualified to be a cluster head. So I will have to look for the next one. The next one is 27. Again, 27 is not associated here, but it is associated with 33 because 33 was the second most relevant node. So it will be associated, so it's not qualified. So by counting out those nodes, which are a certain hop distance away from a cluster head, I can make sure now the clusters are distributed. So this is what I get. So according to their relevance, first I assign 18, then I assign 33, then 24, then 10, 
and then 17. And all nodes which are one hop distance away from this cluster heads, they should be associated with them. So this is how I can create cluster heads. But you can see that there are other nodes which are not associated. So either I have to associate them to the nearest cluster head, for example, all these blue nodes to this one, and all these blue nodes to this one, and so on. Or instead of saying, okay, the top five, I can now increase to top eight. So instead of using five cluster heads, I can use now eight. If I do so, now I can increase a more fair distributed number of uh, clusters. And all the others can now associate with the nearest one. But now the problem, remember, is that the more cluster heads, the more intensive their activity and the more probable the network can fragment in case they exhaust their energy. So I can now, instead of increasing the number of cluster heads, I can increase my criteria. Now I can say, instead of just two hop distance, look here, the minimum hop distance between any of the cluster head is two. So you can see here, this is one, one, two. From here, one, two. So I can, I have defined the minimum distance between any cluster head, heads two. Now instead of two, I can say three hops. That means all nodes which are two hop away from a cluster head should be associated with. So this is, for example, how I can define. So all nodes which are two hops away from a cluster head should be associated with this cluster head. So according to the relevance of the nodes, in this case, you remember, always 18 is the, the most relevant. So I will first define its cluster or its child nodes. So all nodes which are two hop distance away from it will be associated. Then the second one is now 33 and the name so on. So what we get is here. So you see now the number of leaf nodes which are not associated with the, cl the nearest cluster head is right, significantly reduced. That means now nodes have almost uniform end-to-end latency and the burden or the, uh, the, the, the traffic burden is shared among the cluster heads more uniformly. Now, be, I, I, as I said, the cluster heads exhaust their energy more quickly than the child nodes because they have to aggregate data from the child nodes. They have to forward the, the, the packet on behalf of the child nodes. They have to define a sleeping schedule. Uh, they have to synchronize time. It is an intense assignment. So what we can do, nodes have to rotate roles. So cluster heads can work only for a limited amount of time. When that time is over, now we have to redefine our clustering uh, assignment all over again. For our case, it is simple. What we do is we will just remove these nodes from competing as cluster heads and we use the same relevance table, the same minimum distance to select cluster heads for the second round. For our second round, for example, this is how it looks like. 18 is no longer a cluster head because it has already served as a cluster head. 33 is no longer a cluster head because it has already served a cluster head and so on. So this is the second way of defining cluster head. So nodes can rotate this role to make sure that all of them exhaust their energy more uniformly. But the, the, the establishment of clusters and cluster heads improve communication because now nodes, these cluster heads can directly communicate with the base station or with the next gateway. 
So I hope I have given you a good overview about routing protocols and network topologies uh, for wireless uh, sensor networks. To uh, summarize, uh, routing is essential to make sure that packets are uh, delivered from a source to a destination. We talk about routes only when we have multiple options. Otherwise, we are just simply talking about multi-hop uh, communication. Routing is quite energy, if, uh, energy intensive, compute intensive, involves multiple uh, nodes. So it has to be planned with care. Uh, it also uh, costs energy and affects the end-to-end -end, uh, latency of uh, packet transmission. We distinguished between uh, flat topology networks and hierarchical topology networks. Uh, flat topology uh, networks enable uh, uh, the seamless uh, definition of uh, routes based on uh, communication uh, at a neighborhood or at a local uh, level. Uh, but uh, flat topology network, as I said, are robust, but energy uh, intensive. We also considered uh, proactive versus reactive uh, uh, routing protocols. Proactives uh, try to minimize latency, but they are uh, energy intensive. Re in a reactive uh, uh, based uh, routing protocols, routes are defined only when uh, the demand uh, arises, but as a result, uh, it has a larger latency than uh, proactive uh, protocols. Uh, cluster or hierarchical topologies are uh, efficient, enable duty cycling, but the only problem is that the setting up uh, process is uh, quite elaborate and uh, complex. It has to be used when the network is intended for long to medium uh, term uh, monitoring. Uh, by this, I come to the conclusion of uh, today's uh, lecture and thank you and uh, goodbye.